Hello. Welcome to this walkthrough for the AP Computer Science Principles Create task. I'll start by showing you this sample program here. Next, I'm going to show you and explain a skeletal outline of the code used to write this program. Finally, I'll refer you to some resources that will help you with the skills needed to complete various parts of the Create task. I encourage you to use this video in conjunction with another resource, Free Response and Rubric Walkthrough, which is resource number one in the video description. This is a simple program that takes a letter and then outputs all of the elements in the periodic table that start with that letter. When you're creating your video for the Create task, you need to demonstrate the program input, program functionality, and the output. You don't need to do a voiceover like I'm doing. For the first piece of input, we click on the text box and put in a letter. I'm going to put in the letter B. Second piece of input is we click on the Print Elements button. The output is the list of elements from the periodic table that begin with the letter. Let's try it again, this time with the letter J. In this case, there are no elements starting with J, and the output tells us that. In the written response for part 3A, we need to explain three things. Number one, the overall purpose of the program. Number two, the functionality demonstrated in the video. And number three, describe the input and output in the video. I just talked about the input and the output that we saw here, so I could use that information in my written response for part three. Part two asks us to describe the functionality demonstrated in the video. The functionality demonstrated in this video is that the program can take a letter, and then it'll give us the list of elements in the periodic table that begin with that letter. Answering part one, describe the overall purpose of the program, is more difficult here. The overall purpose of the program is what problem did we design this program to solve? And in this case, there really is no problem that is solved by this program. So it would be difficult for us to answer part one of 3A based on this program. This is something you want to think about before you start designing your program. Not only do you want it to have functionality, but you want the functionality to help you solve a problem that the program was designed to address. Now let's take a look at the skeletal outline of the code used to write this program. Here is an outline showing some code and some pseudocode for this program. This program was inspired by one of the code.org sample create tasks. You can access the sample create tasks in resource number 10 in the video description. This is just a sample program to explain some concepts. Your program should look different, partly because it will have a different topic and function, and partly because you want the code to be your own work. Check with your teacher about policies for using outside resources, and check out resource number five to know how and when you need to cite code. In the first line, I'm declaring a global variable called elements. I'm going to need to set it equal to all the elements in the periodic table. There's two ways I could do that. The first way is I could hard code a list of all the elements in the table. So I could say hydrogen, helium, and I could keep going on like this. However, that's a lot of work, and that's probably not the best way anyway, because if there was a new element discovered tomorrow, I'd have to go in and edit my code. The best way would be to go to the data tab here and import a table that contained the information that I wanted. I can take out one or more columns and turn each of the columns into an array and have a corresponding variable. So in this case, I'd want to import a table about the periodic table, and then I'd take the column for element name. If you want to learn more about how to import tables and to load columns from those tables into arrays, check out resource number two in the video description. However you get the data into the array, whether you hard code it or you import it from a column in a table, 
you want to make sure you show that line of code in the appropriate part of the free response section 3C. You may hear me use the term array and list interchangeably. An array is the type of list that we are using in AppLab. However, the curriculum material and the create task instructions will use the more general term list. I will often use the more specific term array. Here I'm declaring another global variable, this one called elements filtered, and I'm setting it equal to an empty array. Later on, I'm going to pick out specific elements from the elements array and then copy them into the elements filtered array. Next, I've got an on event event listener. And this event listener is activated when btn print elements, which is the name of this button here, is clicked on. And then it calls this anonymous function here. Inside the function, we declare a local variable which letter, and then we take the data that the user has typed into the text box and put it inside this variable. If you want to learn how to get data out of a text box, check out resource number three in the video description. Next, what the program does is it calls the function remove by letter, and it passes it the argument which letter. So whatever data is stored in the variable which letter gets passed to the parameter letter in this function remove by letter. If you want to learn more about arguments and parameters, how and why to use them for procedural abstraction, check out resource number six in the video description. In App Lab, we're using the term function. However, in the create task instructions, you'll see them using the term procedure. Different programming languages use different terms for the concept of a function. Since a create task can work with many different programming languages, they use the term procedure to represent the concept. However, when we say function in App Lab, we're referring to the same concept that they use for procedure in the create task. So when the function remove letter is called, we pass whatever value was in which letter to this parameter letter. Here, I didn't create a new variable elements filtered. I just took my global variable elements filtered and I just set it back to an empty array. That way, every time remove by letter is called, it resets the array. To be clear, I'm not actually showing you the code to reset it back to an empty array. I'm just describing what would have happened in the program at this point. What happens next is the algorithm goes through the list of elements. It identifies the elements that begin with whatever the value is in the letter parameter. And then it puts a copy of those elements into the elements filtered list, which again starts out empty. If you want to learn about filtering a list, though not the particular algorithm that happens here, check out resource number four in the video description. Don't feel that your program has to do something like this. There are many ways to meet the requirements for the project, and this is just one sample that was used in this demonstration. Before you start working on your program, spend some time thinking about how you can make a useful program, and use resource number one to understand what features and functionality your program has to have to meet all the project requirements. This part of the algorithm here included sequencing, selection, and iteration. And sequencing, selection, and iteration are required by row five of the rubric. To learn more about what these terms mean and to see some examples of them, check out resource number seven in the video description. So after we've gone through this portion of the algorithm and we have a list of elements that start with whatever value is in letter, then we have this piece of code here. This is an if and an else. So first it's gonna check if the list elements filtered contains zero items. If the letter that was passed was J, since there's no elements that start with J, elements filtered would remain an empty list and contain zero items. And in that case, the program is set to output to this text box here, no elements begin with, and in this case, it'd be the letter J. If elements filtered contained one or more items, this would be a false statement. So it would go to the else and it would format the data in the list and output it to this text output box. 
If you want to learn more about conditionals like if and else, check out resource number 8 in the video description. One of the reasons for using an if and an else in this algorithm is to help meet the requirements for row 6 on the rubric. Row 6 requires two different calls to the function, and each of those calls needs to pass a different argument or arguments, depending on whether you have one or more parameters here. In both cases, to meet the criteria, you need to have at least some difference in which lines of code are run. It's not enough just to have different behavior from the function. In resource number six, I demonstrate where you can have different behavior from a function by passing different values to the parameters, but that doesn't mean different lines of code are going to run. In row six, you need to have some difference in the lines of code that are run. So if the argument that's passed to this parameter it has a letter that's going to end up with elements filtered being empty, it's going to run this line of code. Whereas if there's passed a letter where it has one or more elements in elements filtered, then it runs this line of code. So depending on the value, either this line of code or this line of code will run. And that'll help meet requirements for row six. Don't feel boxed in by this example. Focus on creating an interesting, useful program and think about how can you have the value that's passed to the parameter or possibly multiple parameters affect which line of code is run. Another thing to think about when designing your program is 3C of the written response will ask you to both describe what the identified procedure does and also how it contributes to the overall functionality of the program. In a case like this, where most of the program's functionality is built into one procedure, it could be difficult to answer both of those questions well. You may be better served by having more functionality outside this particular procedure, or have multiple procedures in the program that all take care of different tasks. That way it'll be easy to separate the function you're writing about with the rest of the program. Some other resources to use. The free response and rubric walkthrough will help you understand the free response questions and how the rubric will evaluate the answers to those questions. Resource number five, citing code for the create task. Resource number nine, the official create task rubric. And then finally, some sample create task with written commentary. This is very useful to look through a number of these Try to grade them yourself and see if your grades match with the official grades. You'll see a lot of neat programs and very different ways students were able to meet the criteria in the rubric. If you've got any ideas for future tutorials, let me know in the comments. I'm especially looking for feedback and ideas from other AP Computer Science Principles teachers. Good luck on your create task. Thanks for watching. Please hit the like button and then leave me a comment down below. To see the next video, click on the image on the left side of the screen. To see the entire playlist for the series, click on the image on the right side of the screen. And to keep up to date on all the latest content, hit the subscribe button in the middle.